Good morning, and welcome to our podcast series, Voices Unmuted, Climate Change. My name is Katie Cook, President of the Student Awareness League. Along with the Spokane Community College Peace Institute, we are happy to present to you our seventh visual podcast focusing on climate change. With us today, honored guest, the President of Spokane Community College, Dr. Jenny Martin, offering a welcome. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Spokane Community College, where we are pleased to host our Peace Institute in this important podcast, the podcast series, but specifically today talking about climate change. We are so fortunate to have so many talented faculty who are willing to share their expertise today as part of this podcast. And I also see so many of our faculty in the crowd today, former faculty in the crowd today as well, who are also supportive of this important work. I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Katie Cook, who was just up here last week, won an award from the governor, Governor Jay Inslee, because of her work on civic engagement with our Peace Institute. So I would like to give a recognition to Katie. We have so many amazing student leaders at our college who are committed to engaging the community in these important conversations. So thank you for that, Katie. And to the rest of our students who are here in the crowd, but also on stage, so important. So with that, again, welcome and thank you for being here today. We look forward to these interesting insights from our wonderful faculty, as well as the, the, mod, the moderation through Dr. Scott Finney and our very talented, own homegrown Angela Wisner, who leads this work on our campus. Thank you. Next, we welcome Professor Rob Vogel, Department of Communication Studies to introduce today's podcast. <clears throat> the Peace Studies Institute of Spokane Community College presents authors Dr. Scott Finney and Professor Angela Davis Wisner in a dialogue, Voices Unmuted. This episode, Climate Change. Our guests for today's panel are Spokane Community College faculty all-stars, Professor Jeffrey Bagwell, Professor Diana Osborne, and Professor Joe Hughesby. Dr. Jeffrey Bagwell is a philosophy professor at Spokane Community College with over 13 years of teaching experience. He previously taught at Xavier University and Duquesne University where he earned his doctorate. His scholarly work focuses on Plato's theory of truth and meaning with publications in journals such as Aperon, Ancient Philosophy, and Teaching Philosophy. Additionally, he authored two textbooks on formal logic and epistemology for community college students. Professor Diana Osborne earned an MBA from Purdue University and was, has instructed economics and business courses at Spokane Community College for nearly two decades. Prior to academia, she managed European Union environmental projects in Bulgaria, focusing on pollution containment, landfill refurbishment, and urban services optimization. Diana served as the faculty advisor for SANE, the environmental club at Spokane Community College, and has volunteered with the Heart of America Northwest and other local environmental and conservation organizations since 2003. Dr. Joe Husby has a PhD in political science and international relations with a focus on political psychology. Joe teaches courses in American government, international relations, and global issues. He has also done research and taught at the Peace Research Institute of Oslo and Washington State University. He's received research grants from the Department of Defense, published research on U.S. counterterrorism strategy, and is co-author of a forthcoming political psychology textbook with chapters on conflict resolution and environmental social movements. Let's welcome our Peace Studies professors. Thank you. And I I'd like to at least uh, 
put, extend to you all a, a, an expression of gratitude. Thank you for joining us today. We're honored to have you as we uh, join with this panel of distinguished speakers on this pressing, extremely pressing issue of climate change. Uh, I hope we, uh, you enjoy the engagement here and we're looking forward to your company and thank you again for coming. Let's give them another hand, I tell you, this is unique. I'll start off with the first question for Professor Bagwell. Can we rely on the predictions that climate science makes about climate change? Thank you, Dr. Finney. Um, the short answer is yes. The predictions that scientists have made about climate change are reliable, and they're reliable because of our understanding of the scientific process in general. One thing that I think a lot of philosophers try to emphasize in scientific practice is how it's a feature and a practice of human beings, which means it brings along all the foibles and the shortcomings of human beings, as well as all the successes. So if you consider the fact that science is based on individual but collective human experience, when we make predictions about any sort of phenomenon or any sort of ob observable experience that we have, and this could be as simple as something like plumbing and building materials and dealing with everyday gardening or cooking, the ordinary everyday practices we engage in all the time, as well as big time large scale scientific theories, they all fundamentally come down to human experience and our own ability to make predictions about what we can not, what we have not yet observed, and try to understand how what we haven't observed can be understood in terms of things that we have observed. When we make those sorts of predictions about what we haven't observed and base it on our own individual experience, but also on our collective experience, we're bringing into play our own our own understanding of our own personal experience and bringing into play the experience of other people, which can be challenging but also fallible. Understanding scientific practice has to be rooted in our own understanding of ourselves for that very reason, which explains why we have to only make predictions about those unobserved future events when it comes to things like climate change based on what we currently understand. So it's inescapable to some extent that we're going to be challenged by any prediction about what we haven't yet observed, no matter individually or collectively, while at the same time we cannot help but try to make those predictions and try to understand how they would work based on our own experience. Thank you very much for that. The scientific community has to have the economic focus as well to be able to get the big picture. So Professor Osborne, what is the economic impact of climate change? Well, if it didn't have economic impact, we probably wouldn't be talking about it at all. And um, I want to dovetail with the discussion of Professor Bagwell and point out that the difficulty of even estimating the economic impact of climate change is precisely this trade-off between what is happening now and what will happen in the future and how do we predict it and estimate it. In other words, climate change is what we say in urban planning, in social sciences, such as economics, uh, is a wicked problem. And that is not a judgment statement, that is a term from network theory, from urban planning, and it says it is a complex problem that requires the cooperation and insight from many different sciences and fields of human experience. Just look at the composition of our panel, and if you look at the audience, you're gonna find out Professor Andy Buddington, with whom we co-advised SANE, which was a, a, an organization that used to exist here on campus. Uh, Professor Glenn Cosby, who started it. And SANE stands for Student Association for Nature and the Environment. And it was a lovely initiative of students here trying to dovetail and have a grip of this wicked problem. And it's wicked, thank you, yes, thank you. It is wicked because 
we are going to have a complex solution, which is going to require from us to cooperate, even to estimate the economic impact. And we will have to find a political decision, which means there are going to be winners, there are going to be losers. Not everybody is going to be happy with how we decided. But the good news is, because there's a lot of anxiety around climate change and our kids seem to, to catch it. The good news is, although we're not going to solve it perfectly, we'll be okay. There is a chance for us to be okay. And I am looking at young people here, and it's, I honestly believe this is, where, this is where it's going to come from. So far, we have been able to stay a tad bit ahead of it. Not where we want to be, but a tad bit ahead of it. However, the impact is here. And if there was any deep debate where it was really on the table, global temperatures are showing us not so much. We are seeing that uh, the hugest econ impact happens to be from floods, economic, uh, from natural disasters. And it's between floods and storms, droughts, and, and various things having to do with the water cycle outside of my field. But we are looking at ways to solve it as well. And I think that needs to also be in the discussion because the whole purpose of it is not for us to wring hands about current economic impact and its various impact on various groups, but it is also, all right, here, it's coming, what do we do about it? And really, we can mitigate and adapt. Great, Great. appreciate that. Thank you, Professor Osborne, appreciate that. Well, Professor Husby, when we think about the uh, multi-dimensional, I would say volatile arena of politics, what would you say are the political challenges to climate change? Go ahead, give it a shot. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the, the nature of, of the problem uh, is not well suited for democratic solutions. Uh, all the, not to say it's impossible, but it presents challenges that have existed in politics forever. Uh, number one, it, it's, a, it's a collective action uh, problem, and, it's, and that requires eventually, the way we usually solve that is through some sort of central authority that can compel uh, participation so that, uh, that people don't receive the benefits of action without having to contribute and pay for the cost. So, uh, but the climate change is a global problem and we don't have a central authority to compel participation and impose costs uh, globally uh, yet. And so we have this, what we call in politics and other fields, a free rider problem where people are hoping that the early actors or the early uh, adopters to new technology that will uh, and changes in behavior that will reduce uh, climate change effects uh, will incur the cost and they can receive the benefits. So that's, that's one problem. Uh, another problem is that there's this uh, aspect of present bias where the, the costs, the, the real costs of climate change are in the future uh, although we are seeing them now, but they become much greater in the future and uh, are the consequences of them. But the best solutions are things that we have to do now. And we as humans and in politics tem tend to be biased towards uh, things that are more present. And in democracies in particular, we have dynamics where uh, our leaders and our voters uh, us and the people we vote for are more focused on present problems and our leaders are interested in winning current or the upcoming elections. So we get this dynamic like uh, in, in, in our current president is not alone in this but you know he campaigned on this idea of uh, reducing emissions and getting 50 percent reductions over time and uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 uh, and the same day calling on OPEC to increase oil production, right? Why? Because he's trying to reduce the cost, energy costs and oil costs and uh, help his political situation, right? So we have this dynamic. Uh, the other issue is that uh, our political system 
we invite participation and that introduces all kinds of different uh, problems from special interests and lobby groups and, and status quo and as you mentioned winners and losers uh, these people oftentimes or these groups and entities either have uh, vested interests in not changing and not being one of the losers of, of this process and we've seen over the recent years and in this topic in particular um, campaigns of disinformation uh, by certain lobby groups uh, specifically oil and energy and uh, agriculture and cattle and beef industry campaigns to either uh, reduce the the severity of the problem in public literature or to present it as a, some sort of uh, false narrative. And uh, the public, which we also want to participate in this, uh, can be susceptible to this as well. Uh, uh, the other aspect is that uh, politics is kind of, and especially democracy, is geared towards compromise. And that then produces less than ideal outcomes for, for a problem like this that is both, um, you know, consequences are in the future so we can make compromises now maybe to get some less ideal outcomes but acceptable uh, the, the some of the science says that that's not really the way it will work there, there, there there's some sort of tipping point and if you compromise past that tipping point it won't really matter so those those are some of the many political problems yeah so we've had a nice overview of the three areas do you want to bounce off each other before we go to another round? I do want to dovetail to, into what you just said. So I, I sound like Chad GPT right now, dovetailing and delving into a problem, but here it is. Uh, cognitive biases really, really interfere with our decision making. And uh, when we look into the whole way humans respond to incentives, which is really the subject matter of economics, it's a science that deals with decision making under the conditions of scarcity. So that's the plain definition of it. Our cognitive biases really um, are slanted in such a way where things that have outcomes that are very difficult to quantify are sort of uncertain. Uh, sort of not personal, but the impact of those is diffuse between many groups. We tend to think about them as if they're not big. So being able, even asking me about the economic impact of climate change is trying to quantify the suffering that will come because it's too hot, there's not water, too much water, because uh, it's too hot, too cold, uh, natural disasters are coming, and we know that when the natural disaster is right here on our doorstep, it is harder to figure it out, and it is costlier to figure it out, but the trade-off is everybody's on board. On the other hand, when the natural disaster might come sometimes in the future, we don't know exactly where, we have a general idea, but most likely it's going to be in Africa and Asia. We think about it very differently, and all of a sudden we are much more stingy about costs and much less likely to cooperate with each other, which is what uh, we are finding out is the way we are finding a solution to this thing. Ideal solution, and I'm going to pass the ball to Dr. Bagwell here, it's like ideal for whom? We get to pull the rug or the blanket in our little direction here. It is it's going to be people in Europe, the people who paid for it, the people who are developing currently, who is going to find the ideal solution? Because, you know, it, it might look very different depending where you are on the globe and how much resources you have. So yeah, as I keep saying, this is a wicked problem. It's going to have a complex relationship. And the biases in our political process are also there. I mean, democratic decision making is, is wonderful to factor in all those different interests. Using market-based solutions is wonderful because expecting people to put aside their self-interest really did not play very well in the country I come from, Bulgaria, during communist times. Really did not. 
And uh, we see that, yeah, we have to go with the market-based solution and democratic decisions, but they take time. <laughs> they take time. Yeah. Ph philosopher, tell us. Tell us what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think this is a segue in probably to another question that I expect. So about cognitive biases, and this goes back to the question about science. Philosophers, especially any of you who have taken a philosophy course, know that philosophers are very concerned about cognitive biases and trying to find ways to get around them. And if you've taken a psychology course, you know that that is very difficult. Even recognizing that we have a bias is not necessarily a guarantee that we're going to be able to avoid effect, being affected by the bias. Biases are very challenging for that reason. One way that philosophers try to get around this, and this goes back to questions about maybe skepticism, which is going to be a big part of any discussion of climate science or climate change, is how we come to understand why it is that there are skeptics about this. When the evidence seems so overwhelming, so tremendous, and also such an urgent concern, for all the reasons we've heard, why are there people who will still doubt that? Well, again, if you go back to, I think, just a general understanding of science and how it's rooted in our human nature, it sort of makes some sense that there's gonna be skeptics. All of you probably know that there are people out there who, are, who doubt the, the, spherical, the spherical shape of the earth, right. even, to this still, even to this day, even though we have known for at least a thousand years, more than that, that that's probably not true. Not even not probably, pretty conclusively not the case, right? The earth is not flat. But, if you even consider something as ironclad as Einstein's theory of relativity, which I won't go into a whole lot of detail here, but that, that theory has been around for 100 years and literally every scientific experiment that's come close to testing Einstein's theory has conclusively shown that it was correct. There is no evidence against it that I know of. Although, in 2012, I'll just mention, there was an experiment conducted in Italy that suggested there might be some room for doubt, even about Einstein's theory. And that experiment was an experiment in terms of the, the speed of a photon. According to Einstein's theory, nothing travels faster than the speed of light, nothing. It's the speed limit of the universe. If even one particle traveled faster than the speed of light, through 130 kilometers a second, then Einstein's theory wouldn't be kind of wrong, it would be completely wrong. Every part of it. That means all of our understanding of like nuclear physics would just go right out the window. I mean, if you saw Oppenheimer last summer, all of that would be unclear to us. The point is, even ironclad scientific theories like Einstein's, because they're rooted in our human nature, can't be fully conclusive. There's always a chance that it could turn out to be wrong. And that's why we end up with climate skeptics. Right? Because, there's, because we're rooted in human nature, because of what we are, not anyone is infallible. And so there's always a chance that we might turn out to be wrong or mistaken in some way. It's important from a philosophical point of view to understand why it is, not that it's reasonable necessarily, but why it is that there can always be skeptics. And the question for us has to be, how do we address it? And necessarily, presenting more and more and more evidence for a position or for a scientific theory, as effective as that might be, will not always guarantee that you're going to be able to address the skeptic. At some point, you just have to act because that's all you can do. That's interesting. That's really Appreciate that. Thank you, Professor Bagwell. Professor Osborne, let's bring it all close to home now with this question. How does climate change lead to economic e inequality? Well, it has to do with our different control of resources. It's like we start at a different line. We do not have equality of opportunity. And this is impacting all areas of our lives. And it has to do with how can we respond to climate change. And just to um, continue the thread of thought here from Professor Bagwell, I want to point out, and again, I am, I don't know, I am the solutions girl. I want things to be solved even if not perfectly. Because an imperfect solution 
is better than the perfect, very late, non-existent solution. So we want to do something, but the speed of response does have to do with thoughts of equity, because if we were to do it really fast now, it's not going to be equitable. And we understand that part of education has to do with the understanding that we do keep track of the disasters and bad things that did happen. And we kind of are a tad bit blind. Again, this, this thought about cognitive biases, about the disasters and horrible things that did not happen, that somebody prevented. I do know who was the person who invented the atom bomb. I know the name of the president who dropped it to continue the thought, but I am really rummaging in my head to find the name of the Russian soldier that did not press the nuclear button in Russia during a crisis that prevented a nuclear war from happening. And I even know about this incident, which probably is more than most people do. So the disasters that did not happen that really plagued Mark Twain once upon a time and led to a lot of worry are worth understanding that they were there because it is kind of nice to see they did not happen. And I very much am hoping that one day people are going to be talking about climate change the very same way we're now a kind of snickering about the Y2K crisis. It's like somebody thought that something was going to happen and it did not. So my ideal solution, that's Diana's ideal solution, has nothing to do with life, is that we are going to be like, remember when those people were talking about climate change? Nothing, nothing was really coming out of that. But the truth of the matter is for us to end up there and for us not to have a disaster at year 2000. If somebody thought about it and made little tweaks in the code so that possible drop balls were caught. And I feel that this is a way we can approach climate change. And in terms of equity, there is this thing. Again, we have two ways to go about preventing and dealing with uh, the climate solution. And it has to do with, on the one hand, mitigate, which means spend money now, and you're gonna see the payoff. Way in the future, we don't know what will be your return on investment. We don't know who exactly will benefit, but we are sure many people will benefit. And one thing economics can tell you is solving the problem now will probably cost you much less. The other way you can also approach uh, climate change is to adapt to it. In other words, you know that it's going to be hotter, you know there are going to be more floods, you know oh, there are going to be more droughts. Well, build yourself a dam, have the best air conditioning system, choose your residence at some spot of Earth where rising uh, levels of the ocean is not going to erode your property. And I'm hoping at this point everybody is recognizing that wealthier individuals, wealthier nations seem to be choosing that approach, Ad adapting to it and not worrying about it as things come. And it is kind of a little bit, we're solving it for ourselves, everybody else deals with it a little bit. So it is very political. So, Dr. Hughesby, let's go with that. Uh, what happens through the political lens if there's no inaction? Is this really about power? Is that how it's going to get done? Uh, it, uh, yes. It, it, <laughs> uh, the, the political lens, if, if, if we don't take action, uh, tends to get uh, more narrow and more extreme. So. Uh, one of the things to think about is the cost of inaction is that it limits your options later and your options tend to become more dire or drastic or extreme. Uh, so uh, one thing to think about is if, if you find that the conversation around climate change mitigation and reduction of carbon and methane is, is something that is impinging on liberties and freedoms now, uh, 
wait 30, uh, 40 years and see what it looks like then. Uh, because crisis usually doesn't produce uh, good outcomes for liberties. <clears throat> and there's a broad consensus that we're heading towards a crisis if we don't have inaction. Um, so uh, that's one thing that happens to the political lens. It, but there's also this aspect of power and wealth and that uh, wealthy countries are, are, are more well suited and prepared to deal with the consequences even though to this point, they're the most responsible for the emissions that have caused the problem. But uh, that's unlikely to last forever. <clears throat> and uh, the idea that you can kind of shield yourself from all of these things is, is a bit misguided. Uh, the temperature rising in, in globally means that it will rise where you, you are, no matter how much money you have. And you know the Midwest of the continental United States, under the more moderate to extreme predictions of outcomes is pretty dire for the, the, you know, the farmland in this country and drought. And, uh, and so any solution there, you know, 25 years ago, it was controversial to include environmental concerns and climate change in a conversation about national security, uh, which what seemed absurd to me as a graduate student. It was like I remember arguing at this case 25 years ago, uh, and it seemed mind-blowing to me that it had to be argued. Uh, now, it's like foundational assumption level statements at the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, all of our intelligence agencies, all of ev everything. It's like climate change is a foundational kind of a national security concern, and the world is going to be sicker, poorer, hungry, hungrier, and more dangerous because of it. Uh, and so we have to take uh, uh, actions to mitigate it. So there, there are some positive kind of aspect to this in the sense that now we're understanding it. And I also wanted to go back to your mention of, of the younger people. Uh, all of the polling shows that while the partisan divide between Republicans and, and Democrats, uh, conservatives and liberals is interesting and it's the most stark, uh, the actual, I think, most interesting division is uh, across parties, the divisions are changes in attitudes uh, in, in age. And it's very clear that uh, every generation you go uh, down in age, you have about a 10 to 15 percent jump in concern of climate change as a top priority uh, every generation. So millennials care about it about 30 percent more than boomers do. And this goes into bias around presence, uh, but it also has to do with uh, education uh, and concern of, you know, uh, or awareness of the problem. So there is hope there in this sense, and that's across parties, you know. So. Uh, I, I love that. That's very good. Uh, Professor Bagwell, what is the basis of our obligation to combat climate change? Do we have an obligation? Oh, man. <laughs> Come on. I don't, have a short, I don't have an easy yes answer to that, I'm afraid. But as you guys can probably see, there's very clearly an ethical component to everything we're talking about. The, I mean, when Diana talks about how we should, or when Joe talks about how we ought to get together and work together collaboratively and cooperatively in a democratic system to try to address some of these concerns, that we should address these concerns, there's a moral obligation of some sort kind of lurking behind that. And that is a, a difficult, and, ha I, and this is partly my philosophical view, Philosophers do not have easy answers to those questions all the time. There are some times, some occasions, when it's very clear. You know, so here's bias again, but also just live situation of an individual person. I'm a parent. Many of you are parents. I have children. My children will have to live in that future. I care about their well-being, and so it's a pressing and immediate concern for me to know that they're gonna have a future that's bright and at least as good as the future, the, the life I've been able to lead. And that doesn't look so nice given our current scientific understanding of what the future probably holds for people who live in a, cli a changing climate. But that's me and I'm a parent and not everybody's a parent and so they are not always gonna share those concerns and sort of like uh, Professor Hughesby was saying, when you have people maybe at, uh, 
older people or younger people who have seemingly very different understanding and different concerns about what the future holds, some of that might have to do with what they expect for themselves, for their friends, their family, and their children, and some it won't. It won't have a direct impact. I had a student five or six years ago who was 21, had absolute zero concern about climate change, argued with me about it constantly because he will never have children. It's not his problem. He said as much. And you can see why he would say that, right? There's, there's a reason behind that, maybe not a great reason, but there's some reason. It has no bearing on the present circumstance he's in. His problem is getting a job and living the best life he can right now. He's gonna be dead before climate change, in his view, really affects his life. Why sh so the question for an ethicist and for philosophers is, why should he care about this? What moral obligation does he have to the future? There's, and this is why the, where the question gets hard. There's, he doesn't have any personal connections or personal connections that he thinks make him required or obligated to do anything about it. But what about his general obligation to humanity? So this is gonna sound kind of strange, but we have, I have obligations to my children because they're my children. I have to care for them. I have to feed them and clothe them. I do that because I love them, but also because I'm their parent. They couldn't do that on their own. But if you don't have children, we still have obligations to each other, to our community, and everything that's part of it. And philosophers have long understood that, even if not everyone agrees about how that works out. The moral problem comes down to how we go about supporting our community, how we go about envisioning a future for every person, even people who don't exist yet, right, who are not a, a twinkle in anyone's eye, how they're going to survive in the world that's changing climate-wise. How do we account for that? And it's a difficult question, but if we have a general obligation of some sort to support humanity and our life on Earth and the future of humanity on Earth, then we have the obligation to do something. And it may be still an open question of what those somethings are. Thank you, appreciate that. Wow, that was great. That was marvelous, yeah. So that's the yeah, so in, in conclusion, from this, we'll go starting with you, Dr. Hughesby, we'll go to your right. This is the final question because of time. We just have about 10 minutes left. Is there hope from a political scientist give point of view? A, give us a hope. Is there, from the economic point of view, is there hope? Can you address in closing? Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, uh, yes, I, I wanted to quickly add to what uh, Professor Begwell was saying there. Um, the, in terms of the uh, duty to the to the future, even if you don't have kids, but, uh, we have in our makeup as human beings and and members of a nation. One of the core ideas of of a nation is you have a sense of a shared past and a shared future, and we have examples of many many uh, members of our nation sacrificing all of their future for the good of the community. So if you are uh, thinking about or encountering someone with this idea, you might want to remind them or, 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 or point out this idea, right? Uh, not that we have to make that kind of sacrifice. We're talking about much smaller sacrifices, like maybe curtailing your consumption of red meat, right? <laughs> not dying on a battlefield for your group, but uh, reducing the portion of, of, of cattle, right? Uh, so... Uh, <clears throat> But in terms of hope, yes, because the younger generations tend to be much more concerned about this than the older generations, not entirely because they have a shortened time, uh, time span of their, of their sense of the future, but because, also because of uh, awareness and education. That, you know, this is something that younger people have been brought up in. Uh, and also the uh, growing awareness that it's affecting their life now, right? Uh, so, so yes, there's hope in, the, in this regard. And also we're seeing the, the uh, parties that were opposed to climate change policy uh, slowly moving towards more action uh, on it. And the language in the political parties in Europe and the United States, we have now uh, different uh, kind of fringe Republican uh, party groups, uh, activist groups engaging in climate change apart from the, Repo from the, from the GOP and the political party. So th those are cause for, for hope. Yeah. International focus. Great. Great. 
Hello. Yes, there is hope. I think there is a ton of hope. And we have already quite a few solutions out there that are in some shape or form uh, used in order to mitigate climate change. We, we do see that uh, we're using property rights to come up with uh, cap and trade solutions and solutions uh, such as investment in green technology. So we do recognize that there are tensions and we are coming up with innovations to deal with them. The, the latest that came on my horizon was looking at ways to store greenhouse gases, which was not even talked about in my student days when I was a member of uh, a number of uh, conservation and environmental organizations. It is on the table now. So it is possible that the ultimate solution to climate change is somewhere and we don't yet know about it. So. I feel there is a lot of hope because we are learning that those problems are not isolated and impact one another. For example, climate change has a huge impact on global health. We saw that uh, we can cooperate to solve a very complex crisis perfectly. Oh my gosh, no, I am thinking about COVID right now. We do not cooperate perfectly, but we did not not cooperate as well so learning from past experience is always on the table. And I think it is there for us to see how are we going to harness the hope of young people so that we move towards solutions that are great for us. And understanding that the uh, crisis of meaning that we are observing amongst young people, looking for a purpose in life, that is also connected to that problem because people are looking for ways to contribute. And that is an area where there are ways to contribute, whether it is that you're recycling, whether it is that you're reducing your carbon print. And it might sound insignificant to one person, but in economics, in business, the power of the accumulation of the small dripping change is incredible. Anybody who sees the portfolio of a 20-year-old that drips a dollar a month and compares it with the portfolio of investment to a 50-year-old that drips a hundred bucks a month is going to be wowed by the difference, the power of accumulation of small, systemic, widespread change makes. So you might think, it is not a big deal that you're turning off the light when you're not in the room. It is. You might think that turning off your water faucet is who cares, nobody can see me. Yeah, but a million, a billion people doing that really does have an impact on the water cycle. And if that statement right now did not give you a sense that, yeah, we are one, we are part of the system, to me, it is incredibly powerful, and I'm hoping that my kids stay with that power rather than the sense of uh, Greta Thunberg, how dare you? <laughs> I think that we can pass the judgment between generations, harness this new, it's actually across countries, uh, belief in climate change is here, and we can and we should do something about it. I find a lot of hope in that. Great. Thank you, Professor Osborne. Thank you. And it all makes sense that we end it with the philosopher. Is there hope in, in the next two minutes? Can you give us a statement of hope? Yes, I think so. I, I, there is, I think there's hope, but I, it's a hope that has to be qualified about what we focus on. If our, to go back to the question about political action, if our focus is to try to convince every single human being on earth that climate change is happening and that we need to do something about it, I don't hold out a lot of hope that we will be able to achieve that because humans have a bad track record of getting everybody to agree about anything and let alone this particular issue. And that's gonna affect our democratic processes. But there's hope in the fact that gradual change, right? Like Professor Osborne mentioned, that even in political situations, as people grow and change to understand the situation better, as education improves, changes politically will matter a lot. 
Meanwhile, scientists and technologists are changing and looking into new technology to combat climate change. That by itself won't be enough, but it's an accumulation again. And I hold out hope that scientists who have, who have, there's a consensus on this that you hear about all the time, they believe it and they're taking action. It's maybe not enough by itself, but it's enough considering all the other things that people are trying to do. And that gives me hope. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, it's beautiful. Well, let's give our, our panel of guest speakers a hand again. They were uh, very insightful. And I want to thank you again for, for joining us uh, as we conclude the seventh installment of uh, SCC's Peace Installment podcast, Voices Unmuted. And I'd like to close with this one brief sentence, uh, a quote by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. He said this at Columbia University just last December. Very simple statement. In the context of the contention and antagonism and wars and, and I would say rumors of wars throughout this world, he said this one thing, making peace with nature is the defining task of the 21st century. And I think these three have convinced us of such. Let's give them another hand. Thank you again.